So we are somewhat transisting, not too seriously here. We're going to our last chapter in uh, convection heat transfer, chapter nine. And we kind of shift gears in a way. The chapter's titled free convection heat transfer. Sometimes it's called natural convection heat transfer. It's I'll read the first part. It's due to body forces acting on a fluid in which there are density gradients. Okay, so density gradients and body forces. The effect of that is a buoyancy force, which causes free convection currents. The most common case, the density gradient and the body forces due to gravitational field. What that means, let's take an example of that exterior wall. This is an exterior wall facing somewhat south. If it be a nice, warm, sunny day, that sun beats on the exterior of that wall. That wall gets warm. There's air touching that wall. Density gradients. The air gets less dense. As it gets less dense, it wants to rise up. So on that wall, if it's heated by the sun on the outside, density gradients create an upward flow of the air. What's pushing it? A buoyancy force. Take the other case. I put a floor fan right here. I turn it on, I blow air in the wall. That's forced convection a fan pushing air against the wall, forced convection. Turn the fan off, sunny day, wall is warm. And so what happens is that the buoyancy force creates the motion. So in one case, buoyancy force creates the motion. The other case, a fan, a floor fan creates the motion. So that's our, our big change. It works the other way too. If, um, if this room is warm because of that uh, outside wall being heated, the hall side wall is probably cooler because the hall is a cooler place. So the hall side wall is cooler. The air on that wall gets more dense because it's colder and it drops down to the floor. So you can get a a cycle of air in here. Warm air rises up across the ceiling to the hall side wall where it's colder. It drops, it goes across the floor. So you can get motion that way. It's natural or free, natural or free. So the textbook in the introduction to chapter nine, there are some interesting comments. So. I just want to go over that with you. I photocopied that first page in chapter nine and I'll read it with you. So where the arrows are there, <clears throat> It says, since free convection flow velocities are generally much smaller than those associated with force convection, the corresponding convection heat transfer rate are also smaller. It's perhaps tempting to therefore attach less significance to free convection processes. This temptation should be resisted. In many systems involving multimode heat transfer, that means conduction, convection, radiation, Free convection provides the largest resistance to heat transfer and therefore plays an important role in the design and performance of the system. Moreover, when it is desirable to minimize heat transfer rates or to minimize operating costs, 
free convection is often preferred to forced convection. There are, of course, many applications. Free convection strongly influences the operating temperatures of power generating and electronic devices. It plays a major role in a vast array of thermal manufacturing applications. Free convection is important in establishing temperature distribution within buildings and in determining heat losses and heat loads for heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems. Free convection distributes the poisonous products of combustion during fire and is relevant to the environmental sciences where it drives oceanic and atmospheric motions. So yeah, it plays important roles in our uh, engineering world. I mean, even if I want to keep my coffee heated until the end of my next lecture, which I'd like to have, but it's not going to work. Um, I don't want to put a floor fan here and blow over that because I, I know what's going to happen. It's going to cool faster. So I turned the floor fan off. And now this coffee's in, the, in this room where the air is not moving hardly at all. But the coffee right here is hot. This surface is hot. Guess what? I get a boundary layer built up here on the outside, a boundary layer. Caused by what? Caused by these caused by density gradients and a buoyancy force pushes the air up and creates a boundary layer over the perimeter of the cup. So yeah, I want free convection. I don't want forced convection. Same thing with cool, you're, you're carrying cold fluids around. Yeah, yeah, you wanna keep them away from hot air blowing over the, uh, the uh, cool drink. Uh, so it does appear a lot in our uh, study of convection heat transfer. And we're going to go back and take a look and contrast chapter 9 to chapter 7 and 8. So let's go back and look at chapter 7. Okay, so we have, I'll just summarize what we did in chapter seven here. We could either have all laminar boundary layer or maybe all turbulent boundary layer or we could have a mixed flow boundary layer. External flow, flow over external surfaces. Or also chapter seven, we can have flow around a circular cylinder. We can have a laminar boundary layer, a mixed boundary layer, and a wake region. Diameter was D. And we can also have, we looked at other geometries, uh, maybe a square tube like this. each side dimension D. So that was chapter seven, external flow. Now we do chapter eight. Chapter eight, tube flow, internal flow, convection heat transfer. have a mass flow rate, m dot, for instance. This can be uh, laminar flow. This can be turbulent flow. Let's put the velocity on here. Laminar flow. 
is a constant surface temperature, is a constant surface heat flux, is it fully developed velocity, is it fully developed temperature? Answer all those questions, it leads you to what? H. Turbulent flow, we only had one equation, good for everything. What does it give you? H. Every one of these guys, the objective in chapter seven and eight, number one, find H. Because once you find H, you can now find the heat transfer or other important things going on. Typically, we found heat transfer. So get H, find Q. Okay, so now we go to uh, chapter nine. I'll give you different geometries. Uh, the first one, I'm gonna have a heated horizontal plate. So it's like a hot plate in the kitchen. You plug in the wall, the hot plate, it gets hot. You do whatever, heat your coffee on it, heat a soup on it, whatever. But what's happening is, is there a fan in the kitchen blowing over it? No. But the air close to the heated surface, its density goes down. There's a buoyancy force. The air wants to rise. So the heated air is rising off of the surface. Then you can turn this so now it's a vertical surface. And now you have heated, let's say it's heated. And of course, the air again wants to rise because of buoyancy effects, density gradients. And then you could have, for instance, circular cylinders and again heat it. And so the air is rising off of the heated circular cylinder. So that's what we're going to be looking at in uh, chapter nine, which is different. Chapter seven, something is forcing the fluid over the external surface. A fan, for instance. Chapter eight, something is forcing the fluid through the tubes, maybe a pump. Chapter nine, there's no fans, there's no pumps, it's due to natural or free convection. Okay, so that's chapter nine. If you go back, and look just as a summary, uh, table one, one, chapter one, table one, one. Forced convection. Gases and liquids. Free convection. Gases and liquids. And he gives you he gives you a typical range of H values. Gases, twenty five to two fifty. Liquids, a hundred to twenty thousand. Free convection, gases, two to 25. Liquids, 50 to 1,000. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a major difference in, uh, in those guys, you can see. Major difference, uh, 20 to 1, 10 to 1. Gas is high value, 25, free convection. Gas is forced convection, 10 times higher. High value for liquids, for, uh, for uh, liquids, free convection, 1,000, 20,000, 20 times higher, two times higher, 12 and a half times higher. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 don't forget now, 
the resistance, if you model it as a resistance convection heat transfer, it's one over HA. So the smaller H's have the bigger resistances. Big resistance, smaller resistance. Big resistance, smaller resistance. Free convection, 25, 250. One over H. Big number, big resistance, smaller resistance. So that's what we're looking at in chapter nine. Now, this kind of just gives you an idea of what's going on before we get to the uh, real engineering part. So, now we're going to look at what's happening in free convection in more detail. So, we're going to start out and we're going to consider a uh, vertical surface. in a quiescent fluid. And we're going to consider it's heated, so put consider a heated. Quiescent means still, quiet, not moving. Quiescent means not moving, still. Velocity zero. So we're, we'll look at the vertical plate first because that's a simple geometry. There's a vertical plate. So I have this vertical plate. I'm going to measure uh, y this way. I'm going to measure x this way. The surface is heated. Uh, the fluid starts to rise. A boundary layer builds up. So it looks like this. That's the boundary layer. Let's contrast that to chapter seven. You say, why are you calling Y in the X direction? Why are you calling X in the Y direction? No, no, this is what it is. The x direction is measured along the plate. OK, the plate goes up. x goes up. x is measured along the plate. The plate's horizontal. x goes horizontal. y is measured normal to the plate, up. y is measured normal to the plate, to the right. OK, they're different, of course. All right, look at what we had for the um, velocity boundary layer, officially called the hydrodynamic boundary layer. That's its official name. We, we use velocity boundary layer a lot. That's fine. OK, here's what's going on. No slip condition at y equals 0. OK, what's the velocity at the plate? 0. u infinity u. OK, there it is. Let's draw the same thing for free convection. Oh, you got to be careful now because you know what the velocity out here is. The velocity out here is zero. That's what the word quiescent means. Zero. The velocity at the plate surface is zero. It's zero at the plate surface. It's zero at the edge of the boundary layer. Is it zero everywhere? Of course not. The fluid's rising. So now sketch this guy.
So now here is the velocity little u looks like that. Okay, this is velocity boundary layer. Now we'll look at what's going on for the temperature boundary layer. Again, we're measuring x along the plate. We're measuring y normal to the plate. We get the temperature boundary layer, officially called the thermal boundary layer, but we abbreviate and call it the temperature boundary layer. Let's go over here to this guy. Thermal boundary layer. Assume that the plate is heated. Surface temperature, the plate TS. Assume the free stream velocity uh, temperature is lower draw the thermal boundary layer. There it is. Over here, draw the thermal boundary layer. Assume the surface is heated. And assume that the temperature of the free stream is less than that. So it looks like that. So the temperature boundary layers look very similar for chapter seven, chapter nine, but the velocity boundary layers look really different. Okay. This is B, the thermal boundary layer, temperature boundary layer. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. That's, that's for a vertical plate, heated vertical plate. Okay, so now we, with that understanding, we uh, write down the governing partial differential equation. So uh, what we're going to write now, governing PDEs and start off with uh, continuity, conservation of mass. Go to momentum equation. And finally, of course, energy. We set this problem up in chapter seven. And we wrote down in chapter seven, the same three equations, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy.
They're almost identical, but they're different. They're different because, well, conservation of mass was identical. Conservation of energy, or energy was identical. But the X momentum here is different. What's different? This term wasn't here. This term. This term is due to the buoyancy effect. Buoyancy effect. That's the buoyancy force. So you know what momentum is. This side of the equation is the change in momentum is equal to the what? The force is acting on. What's this force? Oh, it's got viscosity. This is a viscous force. What's this force? This is the buoyancy force, two forces. Viscous force, buoyancy force. So that's the difference. This is called the buoyancy force. But it, it complicates matters because previously in chapter seven, we could uncouple these equations and solve them each one separately, for instance. Now, the problem is I see temperature in momentum and I see temperature in energy and that makes it a lot more difficult. They're called coupled equations. So to solve these are much more difficult because the equations are, are coupled. Okay, and let's, let's mention what this guy here is. Um, G beta, T minus T infinity, is due to the buoyancy effect. And I'll put, let's see, I think I'll put, I think I'll put that up here. Um, okay, you know what G is, gravitational constant. We'll use 9.81. Uh, beta. Beta is the new thing. So beta is a fluid property. Called the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. Thermal, it was defined like this. Beta minus one over density times the partial density with respect to temperature, holding the pressure constant. And if you use an ideal gas, Beta is one over the absolute temperature. In the appendix, if it's not an ideal gas or liquids, the beta values are um, given there. Now, the equations can be solved. The results give you the velocity at any point x and y in the velocity boundary layer, or the temperature at any point x and y in the temperature boundary layer. 
but they're not given in equation form. They're given in figure 9-4. That figure gives both the velocity and the temperature. Okay, so in the solution, a new dimensionless number is defined as G R as a function of L G beta temperature difference T S minus T infinity L cubed divided by nu squared. It's dimensionless. And it can be interpreted like you did in uh, fluid mechanics in terms of a ratio of forces, the buoyancy force, divided by the viscous forces, so the Grashof number is related to the buoyancy effect, the buoyancy force. If you go back to fluid mechanics and, re and relate that as a ratio of forces, the Reynolds number, U infinity L over nu, that can be in interpreted as a ratio of forces. In this case, it's the inertia forces divided by the viscous forces. So in chapter nine, free convection, of course, the buoyancy force is really, really important. That's what created the motion. So in chapter nine, this is an important dimensionless parameter. That's an important dimensionless parameter. In chapter six and six, seven and eight, this was the important dimensionless parameter because inertia played the major role. The pump created the inertia of the fluid. The fan created the inertia of the gas. So we shift gears. Reynolds, chapter six, seven, eight. Grashoff, chapter nine, free convection. Okay, so we will then have equations which give us H uh, based on is the plate horizontal? Is the plate vertical? Is it a circular cylinder like this? But we'll do that uh, our next lecture. So we're done for this morning. If you get a chance now, you can go then to any of the sessions you want for the symposium. Chapter eight homework's due Monday, and the symposium write-ups are both due Monday. I'll pass the exams back on Monday.